Hi, everyone. My name is Ariel, and this is a new AF Chats. Today, I'm here with Anya from Adidas Rantastic, and we're going to talk about a topic that I think not enough people think about, but is super important, and that's user retention, like keeping people in your app. Because you work, I talk about how to get people in your app very often. Most of my AF Chats are about marketing and promotion. But once you get them in the app, you want them to stay in the app because if they leave, you just need to get more people and more and more and more people. And it makes life very complicated. Um, Anya has been doing that for quite a while and is very excited about user retention, which I just love. So uh, we're going to talk about it today and we're going to start with what it is, why it's important, because my intro, in case that wasn't enough. Um, and then we'll go to how to do it and how to measure it and really all the things you need to know to get started with something like this. So. Anya, tell us, well, thank you for joining us, number one, and to uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, and also thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'm super excited. Um, yeah, my name is Anya. Um, I am the head of product marketing for the Adidas training app at Adidas Fantastic. As the name already says, um, we are a proud member of the Adidas family, so... Rantastic is still called Austria's very first um, startup. Um, we were quite a bit in the news um, back then. We don't see us that much as a startup anymore. I mean, we're part of one of the biggest sports brands in the world, which is amazing um, and really exciting um, also for us. Um, so we're kind of like this probably mini startup um, within the within the Adidas world um, because we have a site in our office still. So that's um, the one thing that we're always um, very proud of. Um, I have been in the digital marketing world um, ever since I was studying. Um, so I, I did my degrees in, in digital marketing already and started also um, already to work while, while doing my master's degree. Um, I had a focus in the beginning on, on user acquisition. Um, so did that for um, a web um, B2B tool and then also for our um, apps here at Rantastic. And for two and a half years, I'm now um, in my current role as head of product marketing, overseeing user acquisition, CRM, and campaign management for the Adidas training app. So coordinating um, all the marketing aspects when it comes um, to the app. That's pretty much it about me. And in a nutshell, that is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we were talking before this, as you can imagine, and, and one of the things that came up when we, when we started talking about user retention is um, kind of one of the initiatives that you've been working on for a long time was moving away from thinking about just bringing people into the app or um, getting people to pay in the app, but also getting people to really use the app. So retention. Um, how, how did that get started? And kind of how did you even, once you realize that's something you need to do, how did you get started with that? Yeah, um, so we're coming from a background that I guess a lot of people can relate to. Um, I did ROI optimization a lot, uh, I can tell you. Um, but with us um, becoming part of, of the Adidas family, also we um, experienced a strategic change, which, which came quite naturally for us, um, I have to say, because we are part of one of the biggest sports brands in the world. And that gives us the unique um, opportunity to not purely focus on revenue, but also focus on user engagement. And we share one vision with Adidas, and that's that through sports, we have the power to change lives. And how can we change the, pe the lives of people, that's the right order, through sport, if we don't get them into sports? So quite naturally, um, we as the sports brand um, within, within the Adidas group have that goal to get users into sport. And when we experience a strategic change um like one of the first things i was like well we should really look into user retention so before that we looked into user retention as well yes but it was more of a it was a side thing you know like what really counted was was the revenue was the ri um and and all those revenue related metrics and conversion rates and you just had an eye on retention, I would say. But retention was not at the center of, of what we were doing. And that definitely changed a lot. And I was like, okay, so I really need to get up to speed on, on that topic. And I'm very lucky that there are a lot of great resources on, on retention out there. And very soon for me, it started that I really fell in love with that topic because it doesn't really matter what you do. As long as you improve retention rates, you're improving so many other metrics as well. 
Um, and that's the cool thing about it. And I think that's also what a lot of people underestimate about retention rate and retention rate optimization, that it's, it's not just about engagement, but it can benefit you on so many levels. So um, in the very beginning, I really started out with reading a lot of articles. I'm a data nerd um, myself. So if you ask around in the company, we just have feedback talks and you have to like cross out, you know, which value that people, that person lives up to. I always get data driven. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of like the level of data nerd that I am. Newbies sometimes think I'm part of the data team, which I'm not. I'm still in marketing. Um, and I was really just, you know, like, annoying the data team a bit probably, but really asking them like for tons of data and helping me to find correlations in how to optimize for retention rate. And that's kind of like how it all started out. That sounds pretty exciting. I mean, I have been a firm believer in data kind of fitting into marketing and marketing and data. It, it's one of the same in my opinion, because otherwise you would have gut feelings. And I think gut feelings are very difficult to succeed yeah. with. Having I done agree. both the gut feelings and data, uh, data first marketing, and I'm now all about the data. The data is really the, the one thing that can ground everything you do. So speaking of data, um, how do you, what kind of data do you even gather when it comes to user retention? Um, retention is a word that I, I don't know if everyone associates with a specific number or a metric. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, retention charts or retention tables are usually the one thing most developers that I talk to kind of glance over and say there's a lot of numbers and it's a matrix and it's weird and I'm going to think about it later. So how do you make sense out of it? What is retention the way you look at it? Um, so I mean the easiest um, one that you can can probably find on the internet everywhere is just a definition for, for retention rate calculation. And um, you're basically just looking at um, a cord of users who retained and dividing it by the amount of installs um, that you usually get. And then you have your retention rate. And but the, the funny part about it is, you know, certain cohort of users that retains in a certain retention window. And that's when it started. And we were like, retention window. What is our retention window? What type of retention rates do we actually want to look at? So we really asked ourselves, okay, how can we figure that out? And the easiest is to understand your natural product usage interval or product usage frequency, um, as you want to call it. And that was part, probably like the, the starting point for us when we said, okay, we really need to, to figure out how often our users are naturally using our product to be able to determine if we want to look at daily, weekly, monthly, probably even yearly um, retention rates. And um, we did that. Um, so we looked into our monthly active users and you can just um, distribute them over days. Um, so you have, just have this bar chart. Um, on the x-axis, you have the days. Um, on the y-axis, you have the percentage of MAUs. And then you will see them either spiking at the very um, left side of the chart. So between day one, day two, a bit more to the center towards day five, day seven, um, or at the very end, like peaking around 20 days, 22 days, something like this. If that chart peaks at the very left side, it would mean that you have um, a monthly product usage interval because users on average, your MAUs are opening the app one to two times per month. If you have it around three to seven, we're speaking of weekly retention rates because that's when your users are opening the app three to seven times um, a month. And if you are in the 20s um, of it, then we would speak of a daily um, usage um, frequency because then users are opening the app usually more than 20 times um, or on more than 20 days um, in a month. And that's what we did as well. And we figured, well, for us, it's actually, weekly retention. So daily retention rates don't really make sense for us to look at because for us, it matters that we get a user to do a workout. Um, that's the very core of, of our training app. And But it doesn't really matter if the user does it on day five or day seven after install. As long as the user does it, it's good. But I don't really mind if it's day three, day seven or so. And that's why those... Um, Retention rates are also fluctuating sometimes a lot because, you know, it can be in a given month for whatever reason, a cohort is doing it mostly on day five, another one mostly on day six. And you can't really find a reason, you know, it's probably just 
if a lot of users um, install on, on a Monday or so, they might just do then the workout either straight away or probably on the weekend after. So you can't really influence um, that a lot. And this is how we then ended up really working with, with weekly um, retention rates. Um, there is competition or we call them still like our competition. We're in the same um, industry. We're in the same category in the app stores, but the products are very different um, to ours. So if we look at period trackers, nutrition trackers. Those products really only make sense if you use them daily, because otherwise you don't build up the history that is actually the value that the app um, provides to you. So they would have um, daily um, retention rates and it makes sense for them to look at. But if we compare ours to theirs, that wouldn't really make much sense. So we then um, really figure out, okay, weekly retention rates are the ones that make more sense for us. And that's also how we are um, benchmarking us to others and benchmarking also our two apps um, against each other. That's definitely a benefit if you have two apps in your portfolio that you can also benchmark them against each other. Absolutely. Apps that are successful enough that they would have meaningful numbers to look at. So I think something that we didn't mention, in case someone doesn't know what Rentastic is, um, can you give it a, a brief description of what the app, what's the use case for the app? Of course. Of course. Um, so we are working on the Adidas running and the Adidas training app. Um, both are sports apps. So the running app <clears throat> is um, for runners, for cycling. Um, you have GPS tracking there. Um, and we, we help you to, to track um, your sport activities. And on the other hand, we also have the Adidas training app. That's the one I am um, responsible for. And there we offer you a variety of workout content from individual workouts to guided videos, but also training plans um, that are in the app and that you can then do alongside um, our fitness coaches who are providing all that workout content. So we have an in-house fitness um, coach and expert who is um, really like making all those plans and workouts and um, so that we can really provide um, good content and high quality content to our users. So that makes perfect sense for that to be a weekly thing. If someone is, when, when I think of working out, I don't think about necessarily working out every day, but I think of working out maybe three, maybe four days a week. And so that, that you have that data point now, when you know someone downloaded the app and then started a workout at some point within a few days, that's actually pretty good. So now that you have this metric and you know, you know this number, what do you do? What's the kind of the first thing that you do with this number? Um, and so we then said like, okay, let's analyze the data first. And then you easily like see, you know, where you need to act. And um, what usually everybody wants is an amazing month, six, month, nine, month, 12, um, <laughs> whatever retention. But um, I firmly believe that you can never have a good month six or any later um, retention if you don't fix it in the very beginning. So um, our approach is we always start with short-term retention rate optimization, go on to midterm, go on to long-term. Um, I don't think it makes sense the other way around because you're asking users to stay with you for six months and you probably don't even manage to get them to stick around in the first month. So um, really starting um, from, from the very beginning. And um, we then quickly realized when we had that figure and we're like, we're just focusing on short-term retention optimization. That's going to be it that people were asking, yeah, and how do we do it? And we're like, yeah, we optimize retention. <laughs> yeah, but what does that mean, you know? And then we're like, hmm, okay. So it's not just, you know, us um, in, in the leadership of, of our tribe um, that we were thinking about like, what does retention rate optimization mean to us? But also all our team members were asking the same questions. And that was when we decided we need to make retention rates somehow more tangible. And um, we then came up with a pyramid. Um, at the very top of the pyramid is always our company goal. Um, right underneath is the driver metric and at the bottom is the proxy metric. So we have um, our company goal and we figured out that we can drive our company goals through retention rate optimization. So there's a correlation between our company goal and the driver metric. And the driver metric is um, retention rate. So if we speak of short term, that would mean for us um, week one, week two um, retention rate. And then we said, OK, we also need to somehow get that to be more tangible. And that's when we 
invented proxy metrics. Um, that's how we call them. And we were really searching for correlations um, and for, for insights and, and patterns that we could give to the team. So we're not a big fan of saying we need this feature, please build it, because that's pretty boring if you work in such an environment. Um, we more wanted to have a framework that the teams can work with, but that still allows them to be creative within that frame. Um, so our aim for proxy metrics was to, to really set the frame um, for them where they look, where they ideate, um, but not giving any insights on a specific feature because our tribe consists of multiple um, very smart people and, you know, like three um, people compared to 30 people, yeah, I guess, who has more ideas and the better ideas. Um, so that was um, that was really the, the underlying thought um, for us. And we then um, figured out that actually our um, short-term retention rates are correlating with metrics around our core value proposition. So, um, I mean, of course, we should get users to do a workout. That's what the app is built for. Um, so we then looked into the install to activity rate and we set install to activity rate goals for our teams. And um, they then really just got that goal and were like, increase it by X percent. And we don't mind how you do it. Um, we're here if you need support, but um, really like feel free to ideate around it. And they came up with ideas that we haven't even thought of and that are now in the app and performing really well. Um, so it, it really paid off. And we also saw that like this way of doing it really sparked creativity and thoughts within our teams because on the one hand, they had a frame they could relate to the metric, you know, like getting the user from an install to the first activity, that's something they can really relate to. And then when you really know, okay, those are the steps that a user is, is walking through. And then they really ideated on that part. And um, probably to give you a bit of a background, we're working in a cross-functional setup. So um, our training tribe, um, as we call it, um, that is working on the, on the Adidas training app, is consisting of product people, product designers, engineers, QA managers, marketing people, so performance marketing, UA, CRM, um, and, and campaign management. And we gave that metric to everyone. So it was not just a product thing. We really gave it to everyone because product was able to optimize the in-app um, flow and the onboarding. Um, but at the same time, onboarding also concerns CRM because CRM is the one like doing the onboarding messaging journey. And we wanted that to be really aligned. So naturally, they had to speak with each other because there was no way around. Um, and on top of that, user acquisition, they're bringing in new users who are then going into the onboarding messaging journey. So better that CRM and product know which, which type of users coming in because otherwise, what like whom are they building it for? And that really allowed us to connect um, the whole tribe on a on a new level because they were all working towards the same metric and they also understood, hey, I don't have to do everything on my own because if I implement this, CRM can actually send that message and I don't even have to take care of it and CRM will be happy because I'm actually building this for them. So it really like triggered some, some new ideas um, around that. Well, there's <laughs> so much to unpack in everything you just said. Um, so... I think starting with the idea that you found this correlation between installs and activity, uh, which makes sense because that's really engagement. Um, is there a particular activity that different teams care about more or is it any sort of activity? So if I download the app and then I watch a training video or I download the app and I record, um, let's say an exercise session, does that make any difference in how you see that activity or are they all uh, kind of identical? Um, not really. Um, so we, okay. we then also, um, moved on, um, to, um, more midterm retention rate optimization. And there, um, we figured out that, um, that's really crucial what we're doing with the user in the first two weeks and how we are interacting with our user in the first two weeks. And we know, um, that the type of content is not really what matters. So it, not a huge difference of like which type of workout a user is doing as his or her first workout, but it's more the duration of the workout and that one matters. So um, 
we on the one hand have a number of workouts um, a user should be in best case finishing in the first two weeks um, to be more likely to have a midterm retention and st sticking with us um, plus we also have a certain amount of minutes as, as workout duration that a user should be hitting and we're also optimizing our workouts of course then towards that so that we get the users to the minutes that they actually need that makes sense. And that kind of brings, ties this whole thing together. So the idea of everyone really combining efforts to get toward this one goal makes so much sense. So you focus on one metric, whether it's a proxy metric or the main metric, the main driver for ultimately that goal that you have at the organizational level. And everyone knows what they need to do because every, I the way I see it is every team thinks about what they need to be delivering all the time before they go to sleep, after they wake up throughout the day. That's kind of their goal. Um, but you can't have everyone either sharing the same goal because then it's too generic and no one will be able to really drive it forward. And you also can't have everyone just in their own little silo thinking about their own little driver. So then they'll clash. So when you combine them all, um, then everyone has that sort of same feeling. And that's why the idea behind uh, focused KPI or focused metric is so good. Um, I think everything you said makes so much sense uh, in, in that specific context. And then taking that really to the next level and saying, we want to have a specific amount of time spent in the app, but then making sure the app makes it easy to spend that time in the app, that's where the key is. So then having everything combined actually makes so much sense. So really great points here. Um, and I, I do understand why you would need to have, um, how you can combine now short-term retention with midterm retention and possibly even long-term retention because now you have an idea of the intent of this user. So that's super clever. Exactly. And and usually one is kind of like building up on the other, you know, it's not that like the effort that we put in for, for short-term retention optimization is obsolete when we start looking into midterm um, retention optimization. No, you just continue to build up on it. And I think, probably like i've been asked that um in in a podcast and it's like what which lesson took you the longest to learn or which one was the hardest and i think to me it was really understanding that when it comes to retention rate optimization it's always about the core value proposition of the app it's so simple but <laughs> really like living up to it took a while but in the end, like no matter what you're doing at some point we're always ending up with with workouts you know because that's really like the core and the center of our app. So all those proxy metrics that we have, they vary. They are a bit different, but it's insult you know, to activity rate, number of workouts, duration of workouts, things like that. So we're always sort of like getting back to it in different ways. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes really all the sense if you think about it. So, um, so you mentioned that short-term optimization and long and mid-term or even long-term optimization have slightly different strategies or you go about it in slightly different ways. How would you approach um, optimizing or now that we have these metrics, how would you approach improving them in um, a short-term versus mid-term or long-term strategy? I mean, I, the first thought that usually comes to mind is, you know, you can't just send a push to the user after two months, six months whatsoever. I guess what they won't open it if you didn't like um, retain them by then. So either they open it anyways, more or less like organically, um, or that one push they will just ignore it because there's anyways like dozens of, of pushes on their on their lock screen already. So um, what we um, then said is we cannot start optimizing for mid or long term retention when we reach that point because that's when it's already too late. You know then the user already didn't retain. And then reactivating is actually tricky. I mean, we all know that like getting a lost user or dormant user back into the app is, is kind of tricky. So what we then said is um, what which time frame do we have to interact with the user to build a behavior that will lead to a higher mid or long-term retention? So um, for us, um, we then came up with this hypothesis that a user who retains in, in week two um, is also more likely to retain in the mid or long term. 
and we went to test that hypo hypothesis with the data team. Um, so they then actually confirmed that it's right. And then we said, cool, we actually have two weeks, not just one week. Because packing a lot of messaging in one week, you might also risk to lose the user then in the end because they're like, is this spam or what's going on here? So you can really like distribute it in a, in a better way if you have a longer period of time. And then um, we collaborated again with our with our data team and we said, hey, what do we actually need to do? Like, what is it? What's the behavior that distinguishes the retaining users from the non-retaining users? And they built a machine learning model for us, which we call the retention model. And um, there we have two groups of users, um, the ones who are successful and the ones who are not. Um, and the successful ones are, or positive ones, as you want to call them, are those who um, have a week two retention and a mid-long-term um, retention. And then we look what are they doing in the first two weeks. And then we compare them to the negative ones. And then we just cross out the similar things, you know, because if they're both doing it, it can't be a pattern that um, helps us to improve retention rates. And then there were like some patterns that we saw that the positive users did and the negative users didn't. And that's um, what we then started to, to optimize on. That's super interesting. I think maybe some people in the crowd hear machine learning and they go, oh, I can't do that. That's too complicated. I don't have a data team. But I think ultimately, even if you don't go to that extent, obviously having it is super nice because you know that the results are a little bit more um, more significant. But even if you just look at the events that happen within your app on in that period, if it's weekly, week one, week two, or even day one, day two, whatever your retention is, um, I think that's all, that also has some value that you can then use to say, okay, this is what people are doing who are sticking around. Let's improve this or let's highlight this. And then the more time you have to do that obviously gets better. Uh, would, would you agree that that's better than nothing? Definitely. And um, I mean, going back a bit, um, when I started, I was doing retention rate optimization on my own. Um, there was no one else like even <laughs> like focusing slightly on, on that and still um, it worked out. And I was, I was kind of like, you know, just give me access to the database. I will sort of figure <laughs> it out. And then um, I asked my brother for his um, SQL um, documents from university. And that's how I got into SQL. And then I just oh, wow. queried the data and somehow I ended up with something and then I wasn't sure if it's right. And then I'm like, this is so great to you. <laughs> so this is how it all started. And at some point, um, also our data team was like, what the heck is she doing there? You know? And then um, one of our data engineers, I was like, I can't find that data really. And then she was like, okay, show me which query you're having. And I was typing on her computer and our head of data, I remember when he told me, I had a little heart attack when I realized that <laughs> you from the marketing department are writing a query on a computer of a data engineer who has writing rights on our database. <laughs> so you can basically delete all data if you do something wrong. I'm like, oh, I didn't. I'm, I'm fine, Oops. you know. And <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's um, and like with um, with me like digging more into the topic and then also asking questions to the data team. They were like she's actually really like interested in working with us, you know? And I was not just like, oh, can you do me that analysis? I was like, I have this question, how can I answer it more or less? And um, with that, um, we get so much support from them. Also, um, our head of data is, is very open to collaboration. And, um, you know, we really needed a data scientist um, then for it, not just, we didn't um, waste data science resources on a simple analysis that like probably every one of us um, can do. And that's how that collaboration then really evolved. So I started out on my own as well. And a year later, um, the head of data was like, you know, you're going to get a data scientist for your tribe. And I was like, yay. Um, so that was really exciting. And, and that's how it really all started and then evolved um, over time. So I can I can fully agree to to what you said. Like, just start out, you will find something. It probably takes you a bit longer um, compared to if you have like a, a full on um, data team. I also like it, it took me a while until I found which data is in which database and how to connect them through inner joints and so on. But at some point, you're there, and it's fun actually. Yeah, I. That's crazy. That's very very crazy. But that's pretty awesome that you now do all of this. And I think the more access you have, even if you don't end up doing all the models yourself or all the really like 
crazy machine learning yourself. You have so much access. You see so many different data points. And I think in the mind of a marketer to see, to have all these data points will eventually lead to just a good ideas and, and really good uh, strategies to move forward. Because even if they don't make sense now or they don't seem to be complete thoughts now, you can kind of build on it. The more data points you have, it, in my view, eventually the, the clearer the picture is going to get. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's really funny. <laughs> Yeah, and oh. sometimes you even discover data that you don't even know that it's tracked, you know? I mean, also, um, please, everyone, feel free to to write in the chat, but who really knows um, all the data that you're tracking in your product? <laughs> Probably no one. Not even product knows everything because they know the data they're tracking for the features that um, are within their ownership. And when you start, like, really looking at the database, you're like, <laughs> we're tracking this. That's yeah. actually funny. Oh, I could use that probably. And then you're like, you know, also going to them and be like, can we use the data somehow? And can we like use that for this? And can we connect it? So it also triggers new thoughts when you just see like, huh, we're actually tracking this. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's great. Um, there are a few questions in the Q&A panel that I think all core kind of uh, revolve around this. Um, the first one is a question about how you decided which events to track of all events users make in uh, the first or second week? Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, so we are working with an MMP. Um, Adjust um, is the one we are we're working with. And that's actually very easy to track um, custom events. And we basically implement um, event tracking for almost every feature or for every feature that we launch. And the, the level of granularity uh, might differ a bit. And um, in the end, like we really started out with everything that is around the core value proposition of, of our app. Um, and that is what we, what we centered it, um, around. But the more, you know, like we looked into the data and got an understanding of what is actually there, we then said, like, Hey, we also have social features, by the way, you know, like you can have a friend now followers, by the way. Um, but back then friends, um, and we're like, does that have an impact on retention? And that was then like something, you know, like also adding um, that um, data to it. And that's, it just evolved over time. So like you start out somewhere and then you're like, hmm, but if like this feature has an impact, you just start wondering if that might have an impact as well. And that's how you go on and um, track more and more and more. And we see that, for example, for user acquisition, um, everything that's activity related is insanely good um, for us. So a um, little excurse um, on, on the UA side on, on what we did there. So we are tracking the um, finished activities of a user and we have a specific event for the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and so on activity. And um, with an MMP, um, you can also follow that information back to um, Facebook, Instagram, Google, and so on in a GDPR compliant way. And um, we did that and we actually started to optimize on events that are further down the funnel. And we just always had two UA campaigns in parallel. And we just said, okay, let's see which one actually um, performs better. And by that, um, we then figured out, hey, in that market, we can actually go that far down the funnel. In that market, probably not. So if you would ask me how we do UA at the moment, I would say probably differently in every market. But we tested it out how far down the funnel um, we can get. So it's never a mistake to track a lot of events because it really opens up the opportunities that you have when it comes to testing on different levels, like might it be CRM, UA, um, but also on the product side of things. Yep. I think the answer of everything is probably the best answer most times. <laughs> I know because every time, um, so I, I, when I do marketing, our data science team always asks me, do we have this? And the answer is usually yes, because we opt to track everything. Yeah. And so the more you have access, the more ideas you get, and uh, just everything becomes better. So that exactly. makes sense. Um, there's another question right after that uh, about machine learning. And that is how early are machine learning models relaying the info about who will be retained and who will churn? Um, so we, we did that for the past. Um, we looked into, um, finding, finding the patterns and we went back half a year, if I'm not wrong, um, when it comes to the data, because we had, um, a bigger change in, in our product and we then said, well, it only makes sense to, to start from there. 
And um, we then got some patterns, as mentioned before, in return. And now we are running um, the machine learning model on a monthly basis. And we just see if it still returns the same results or if something changed. And if something changed, um, we're acting on it. But um, for now, it's pretty stable. So mm-hmm. we're like getting pretty similar insights. And we also see it on our um, retention rates that um, the improvements are actually working. Hmm. Interesting. So it's not, um, I think the question may have misinterpreted that to be the machine learning tells you for each individual users, uh, individual user, whether they'll churn or not, but that's not what you're really looking for because that's just information. You're really looking at the cohort in general. So you can optimize, so you can use that as, uh, as input to how you optimize. Yeah. Um, that, that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, I love the question. I love the direction it's going. Um, but that's a whole new level of personalization. Um, I would love us um, to to be there um, at some point, but that's really uh, a whole new level of of uh, getting there. Yeah, absolutely. I think in I think in the longer term we'll see more of this very individualized sort of uh, retention optimization or more churn prevention happen because of subscriptions. And subscriptions seem to be the future for pretty much every app. And you're going to get to this point where you're optimizing for revenue. You're going to have to optimize for user retention and conversion, and then user retention on the revenue side. So you're going to be in this like very specific boat. And um, based on the AF chat that we had last week, talking with Joe about what's new in iOS 15, for those of you who have attended, um, you'll know that StoreKit 2 and subscriptions in general are becoming a very big focus for Apple. They have been a focus, and now they're becoming even more of a focus. So I, I bet you will see more of this kind of mindset behind retention and retention optimization creeping into pretty much every app and uh, and games. Games do it very often. So very interesting. Uh, let's see. We have oh, we have a whole bunch of questions. Do you want to? Do That's you see good. the questions on your screen? Do you want to take a stab or pick one? I do. Um, I think we can go um, from the top because that one got uploaded, right? Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so um, uh, tackling the first one um, by machine learning is basically like backtesting your hypothesis. Yes and no, um, I would say to that one. So um, we are looking back um, at, at the data for it, yes. Um, but um, at the same time, predicting the increase in retention rate a certain action can give us. So um, we would then have um, their number of workouts and then there's like a certain number that I can share with you um, here attached to it um, of the number of workouts that a user would need to do. Then we have um, workout duration, then we have probably number of friends and like various other factors. And um, for each of them, um, it actually tells us the increase in retention rate we can get if we get users um, to do that. So um, it ranges from like a pretty low percentage to also pretty insane percentages of, of increase, um, if I'm honest with you. So that's the part that it, um, that it predicts um, for us, but it also looks back at the um, at older cohorts. And with older, I mean like, a month, two, three months um, back, depending on on what we're looking at. And um, then basically forecasting what are the, or telling us what are the the things that are differentiating our users. What does that mean, differentiating your users? Um, The negative from the positive one. So um, as I mentioned before, you know, like there's some who are fulfilling the two criteria of our hypothesis and some that are not. And that's how we divide them in positive and negative. So positive would be a has a week two plus mid long term um, retention. Negative is doesn't have either one um, of them or none, like could be both. And as soon um, as, as we have that, we're always comparing if there's still the same um, characteristics or behaviors that are differentiating them or if that changed. That makes sense. So you always look for you always look for what will work on the people who will convert, or what exactly. works on those people who convert. And there's a similar, or a, I guess, an extension of this. A question from Sinisaus asking: When you separated behavior of retained versus non-retained users, how did you act on that data? Did you try to optimize 
even more retained users, user journey, or something else. And I think that kind of follows that you always want to go after those retained users more so. Mm-hmm. Is that exactly? You um, so um, we started with user acquisition. So what I what I told you before that. In the beginning, we were optimizing on the first activity finished, and then we just started to further go down that funnel um, based on the the number that the retention model actually returned um, to us. And by doing so, we basically changed the uh, campaign goal, and we saw a decrease in CPI, which was very weird to us in the beginning, but it's really the case. Um, a reduction also in the CPA, lower um, cost per retained user and higher retention rate. And we're like, that's too good to be true. We need to do that test again. We did it again. It returned the same results. We then said, okay, we need to do it in another market because that's probably just that market that performs insanely good now. And we had the same results in, in almost every market. So there's very few um, where we can't go further down the funnel. But in most of the markets, um, it actually works um, for us. And then... Um, from from there, um, we then said, okay, what can CRM do to actually um, contribute to this? What can product do to contribute um, to, to getting users to do X workouts, to have a workout duration of X minutes? And this is then how, how it all started. So CRM started out on um, optimizing the onboarding messaging journey. Then um, product implemented features like the suggested workout, such as the training plan, featured workout. Those are all... Um, Features they came up um, after we we introduced the way we're going um, around retention rate optimizations, and that was all brought up um, by the team. So um, that's kind of like what we what we did on that front. And at some point, um, we saw that in the beginning, you know, you have those like steep increases in in retention rate, which is great. And at some point, that curve started to flatten a bit. And then we were like, hmm, what shall we do now? And then there was nothing really obvious in the data. Um, to be honest. So we then said, um, okay, what can we really do? And it took a while and a blog post from Andrew Chen, if you want to know exactly, um, where I read about the adjacent user theory. And I'm like, that could probably be it. So we then said, okay, that's the next thing we're going to do. Um, and basically the adjacent user theory just tells you that um, there's always users who are not successful, no matter how much you optimize for them to be successful and doing exactly what you want them to do, there will always be users who are not doing it. And um, you can ask them via survey and they will respond. And I was like, ah, I don't think they will respond. So um, we gave it a shot anyway. We collaborated with our product design team and, and CRM team. And like pretty soon we had a questionnaire consisting of really just a few questions um, and we implemented it at the very end of our onboarding messaging journey. So every user who runs through our onboarding messaging journey and hasn't done an activity after the first 14 days is a user that we consider basically um, lost. And um, we also stated clearly, like, this is not a desperate attempt from us to actually get you back um, into the app. We understand, like, it didn't work out. It's okay. But please let us know why, because we actually want to do better next time. And the response rate is really good. Like there's a lot of users um, responding to it. And we also give them the option to sign up to um, be in our pool of users that we contact for qualitative interviews, which are then taking also more time. And you won't believe how many users are signing up for this. So they didn't do a workout after the install, but they're very committed to help us improve the product. So it means there was like really an intention to using our product and they are really committed to help us make it work. And that's really valuable feedback that we're getting um, through that. And also, I think it helps us to build a relationship with them because it's not like, oh, you're going to really try to get me back through this somehow. No, we're not. But we really want to do better next time. And I think that's also a message that, that users are really appreciating nowadays when, I mean, we all know how often you get kind of like spammy, like... <laughs> Um, messages that just really desperately try to re-engage you. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Wow, that, again, so many good things in here. And I can fully uh, agree to the point of when you ask, and if you ask honestly and you ask genuinely, people will, even if they don't use your product and they couldn't do what they wanted to do, um, will actually reply. I know because I do that in our own platform, when someone doesn't take action or doesn't uh, connect their account or do one of the activities that we put into that 
um, activities you have to do to get started, I'll send an email and people do respond. And sometimes they get really surprised that I reply back. And so they expect maybe some support person to reply back or marketing person, but no, it's, it's actually me. And it's usually for learning. I, I would love for them to continue and engage with the platform and do and take all these actions. But I'm also very interested in why didn't that just happen on its own? Because that's the kind of platform mm-hmm. I want to build. I don't want to have to ask you and then you tell me. Um, and I don't want to have for you to be confused. I really want you to just come in and get what you want done. And that leads me to another point that you brought up before that I, I didn't have time to touch on. But your user acquisition is very, very deterministic of your engagement and your retention. Because if you bring the wrong people who maybe are not interested in a workout, they're just interested in, in news about exercises or in nutrition or something like that, that may not be the core value of the app. Um, you Retaining them or working to retain them is kind of a waste of time. And you're not going to reach the goals that you have. And optimization is going to be kind of a pain. So they really have to be combined. You have to know what's coming in to understand how to retain him. And you have to make sure that what's coming in actually wants what you're trying to give them. That's such a good point. Um, we have another question from Samantha that's also been upvoted. By the way, if you have a question that you like in this Q&A and you want to hear us talk about it because we're slowly running out of time, uh, please thumb up it or upvote it or whatever you kids call it these days. So we will see it and we'll know that that's what you want to hear. So a question from Samantha who's uh, saying, we are focusing only on the six month retention. Is that the right way? Question mark. Are there any benchmarks data, benchmark data? Um, how much percentage of retention is good or not good in the six month? I kind of messed up the question, but I think you got it. Totally, um, all good. So um, when it comes to benchmarks, it's actually hard to get them. And you need to be really cautious when you get benchmarking data because you need to find an app that is similar to yours. So not just in the same industry, as I mentioned before for us, it doesn't make any sense to compare us to a period tracker or a nutrition tracker. We share the same category on, on the app store. We're both in health and fitness, but honestly, their product usage interval is so different from ours. So um, it really doesn't make sense for us to compare us. If you don't have that advantage or, or the benefit um, that we have that we can compare our two apps um, to one another, and there's usually something you can get um, from your account managers at Google um, or Apple. So um, if you ask them, like you, you won't really know like which competitor it is or, or anything, but sometimes they can really like give you an average of, um, of a competitor group or a peer group, um, like they do in the, in the QBRs, for example. And that's what they, they naturally do, um, which you can, can work with. And there was at Google Playtime in 2019 in Amsterdam, there was this really, really, really good, um, talk about natural product usage frequency. And they divided um, the, the apps into new categories. So there was like one that is goal oriented, which is where our apps fall into, but there were also others. I think there's an article that summarizes it on um, if you go to Medium and the Google Play um, team there. And you can really like, you know, just do a bit of research and find rough benchmarks. I wouldn't say like that's exactly where you need to get, but you can get rough ideas on, on where you where you should be heading. And I'm also tackling the first part um, of the question, um, if it's the right way to tackle month six retention. If that's your like natural product usage frequency, yes. If you also have like your users should be retaining in between. So like you should have them in the first week, in the second week, in the first month, in the second month and so on. I would say always start at the very early stage. Um, That's my personal point of view. And it has worked for us because, as I mentioned in in the beginning, how can you ask them to retain in month six if you don't do anything to retain them in uh, in, in week two, for example? So really starting out there because it's usually the first experience that counts or like, you know, in in love, like it's often the first look. I think it's similar with a product. Like the first experience that you have is really the one that you will remember. And if a user, a consumer feels like you treat them well, you respect them and you offer them a good experience, that can be a big, a big differentiator. And I mean, when, um, when some apps are really hyped and so on, 
Why are they? Because usually you have a really good onboarding experience. That's why people are hyping an app because very often they don't even get like much further than the onboarding. But if the onboarding is already good, that's like a good first impression. And that's nice to have. And then you need to start from there. Okay, how do I activate my users? How do I make them to form a habit? What do I do to continue that habit and so on? So I would always start at the very beginning. And with month six, you're usually already at the stage where a user has formed a habit and you are engaging the user to maintain that habit, probably promoting some new features here and there that are a nice addition to what the user is already doing. While in the very beginning, you have to convey the main message of your product and the main benefits of your product. I think that's a that's a great point. By it's just like you said in the beginning, you got to start at the beginning. You can't just kind of let them do whatever they want and in six months be like, are you still here? Are you? Why not? Um, so yeah. And there is, I, I think the question that is most upvoted right now is somewhat similar. And that is, what are your options to reactivate a user when the data has identified him as having stopped training with the app? Do you do that? Do you look at that? That's the kind of personalization we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, yeah, so we do have um, a attribution model that differentiates our users in different buckets. So um, we have those like very active users or like casually active, um, the ones with churn risk, the dormant ones. So we can definitely like give them different types of, of messaging. Um, what I can tell you, like sometimes we're doing big campaigns um, that we really send to all our users, um, also the dormant ones. But there are also other messages that we're really targeting to the recently active ones, because if you lost them, you really need to do like a specific re-engagement and it doesn't work. You know, like a regular message that you would send to, to an active user will never ever get that user back or it's very unlikely to, to get that user back. So um, to give you an example from, from the running app or so, um, when we do run for the oceans, um, that goes out to all users. Um, we are running to fight marine plastic pollution. We, um, together with Adidas, like are donating money. We are actively cleaning up our ocean. That's a message that can bring a user back. Like even if you are really a runner, you would probably get up and um, into your running gear just because you're like, hey, I have the chance by going for a run to act actively fight marine plastic pollution. Um, what we did last year was um, Home Team Heroes. Um, that was um, a total change of plans when the pandemic hit us. But there were so many people who were fighting this pandemic on the forefront while we were safe in our home offices. So we were like, hey, let's get active for them. We didn't say like, go out for a run. We said like, hey, start to train, like be active. We collected active minutes in that case, not kilometers. So there are certain messages that can really be a benefit and like help you reactivating users. But I wouldn't say like a, a standard message that you would send to, uh, to an active user promoting new content that you have in the app because that user will be interested. Like, oh, hey, there's like new content. Yeah, I was anyways wondering which work that I'm going to be doing this week. So I'm just going to do that one because it's convenient. I don't have to search it myself. That probably won't reactivate um, a, a dormant a dormant user. So really um, testing out and figuring out what can get them um, back into the app, but then also making sure when they are back that you continue the communication with them. And what we also um, started to do with this um, adjacent user theory, like when we learn from our users what they're missing and we're then fixing something, you can also communicate it because they're like, hey, we listened to you, um, we fixed it. Maybe you want to give a product another try. So that can also be the type of messaging that that can work. But just saying, hey, there's new worker content will probably not be working for a dormant user. Unless the content is like exactly what they're looking for. And it's the only content in the market that will answer their one question <laughs> that they woke up thinking about. And the odds of that happening are so tiny that you're never going to hit it. Do you think it's bad to do to try and re-engage users with the kind of content that is not for them? Um, it might lead to them, like if they're annoyed by the messaging, they might just delete your app at some point. Is it really that bad if they're anyways not using it? I don't know. Um, I mean, if you then want to reactivate them, you need to pay for it again by user acquisition and retargeting. That's the one thing. Um, I think in general, like 
with this flood of notifications that are on our phones on a daily basis, we need to be very cautious with the messages that we're sending. And it should really have a value and a benefit for the user because it's a bummer if they opt out of push permissions. So um, I think that's the the one thing that um, one should be really, really cautious um, about. But again, if they're dormant, how much like of a difference does it make for you if the app is still installed um, on a device or not? I think that's a great point, especially with something like Focus in iOS 15, where you, in theory, will have access as a user to maybe filter out some of these notifications. So that could help the um, could help companies m- maybe bombard users with a little bit more because they won't see it. But I don't know if that's a, a positive or a negative. I think if we took everything from this conversation, is a lot of uh, moving forward or improving or optimizing or uh, growing is really relying on testing and experimenting. So you have an idea and you give it a try, and then you act on what the results are, which uh, kind of aligns with what Devron was asking. Devron is saying, if I understand correctly, the core is to understand and build on the right habits. So this is basically behavioral science application. Um, in a way, yes, but you can say that about pretty much everything. So app store optimization, you're understanding your users and you're targeting the keywords. Uh, paid user acquisition, it's kind of the same thing. You go after where they are. And I think the key to all of this is you have to be open to experimenting, coming up with ideas and then saying, does this work? And the and user optimization or retention optimization is an application of that. Uh, and machine learning is a tool in order to do that better. But ultimately, the bottom line is you have to have that sort of mindset. Um, and I think that's why you were, ba- you were able, Anya, to get uh, so much farther into improving up, uh, improving retention because you're thinking, what can I test? Right? Is, is that? Do you think that's right? Yeah, um, definitely. I'm a big fan of testing. Um, I have to admit, and I I don't really like it. Like when when people say, yeah, but then you have a negative test, and uh, it kind of like sucks, you know. And I'm like, well, it doesn't because you know what your users don't like. So even though mm-hmm. the test wasn't a success, you learn something from it. Exactly. Because you know exactly what you're not going to do. And I'm like, we could also not have tested. So we would still be stuck where we have been two weeks ago. Now we know what they don't like. So let's continue to figure out what they actually like. I think that's um, what it is What it is all about um, in the end. And to learn what your users like and what they want also continues to understand what they don't like and what they don't want. Because avoiding that can also give you a bump because you're just like not doing the things that they don't like anymore. So yeah, it's really absolutely. nothing negative. You're just um, stopping the things that they actually don't like or you... Just reassure um, yourself. My team really just passed by, sorry. Huh. <laughs> um, you really just um, reassure that like what you're doing is actually the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it was when I stopped thinking about experiments as a way to just improve, improve uh, whatever metric I was trying to optimize and instead think about it as a way to gather more information, collect wisdom in a way. So if I'm testing a title, that's one thing. If I'm testing a specific behavior, that's another. And really what I want to know is do users like it or hate it? Because if you think about it, the experiment is going to start and end in a relatively short amount of time, whether it's 30 days or seven days or a month, that's 30 days, three months. But the product is going to be around for hopefully more than 30 days. So whatever you learn from the experiment can serve you in the very long term. So that's why it's so important. That's a great point. And I think with that, we ran out of time because we answered all the, almost all the questions. Um, yeah, I, I think it's time to cut it. But thank you very much, Anya. This was really informative. I'm going to have to rewatch this and maybe even turn this into a guide because I think there's so many good points about both user retention, experimenting, and in general, thinking the right way to build this sort of foundation for how to optimize. And I really like this. Hopefully you enjoy this as well. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, it was really, really nice um, talking to you. And as I see, there's still some open questions um, to everyone who's still um, listening in. Please feel free to just reach out to me via LinkedIn. And I'm happy to also follow up on those questions. Um, sorry that we're running out of time um, right now. But yeah, happy to connect um, with everyone through LinkedIn and then also follow up on some um, specific questions there. So thanks again so much um, for having me. And Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and asking great questions. Uh, it's It's been a while since we haven't been able to answer all the questions, but there's just so many good ones. And Anya's and my LinkedIn links are in the chat if anyone really wants them. 
we will also send out this video to everyone uh, later in the week once we have it edited and all ready. So if you missed any point or want to rewatch any of this, there's so much good stuff in this. I'm going to try and make a list of highlights and make it very easy to jump in the video because there's so many good things. Um, and happy optimization. So again, thank you, Anya. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, wherever you are. Bye. You too. Have a lovely evening, everyone.